uh, because of interest in difficult Bible passages, both for preaching uh, and for uh, teaching in Sunday school. Okay. Am I hearing stuff or is it just, is, is it really bad, some background? I uh, know you're hearing stuff. Hey, Phil, can you, uh, can you mute yourself, Phil? Yeah. Phil Baines? Yeah. If anybody's unhappy, you can you can yell at me for as long as you want uh, when we finish. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm real easy. I'm being corrected. You know, being a professor for 40 years, they, they, and it is the truth, especially since I taught almost all graduate school, uh, you learn a lot from your mistakes. Uh, just try to derive an equation on an old chalkboard and make a mistake, and you got 10 students telling you what you've done wrong. And so you it humbles you a bit. So this topic came up, uh, and as I started looking into it, I realized this is quite a controversial topic around the Detroit area and in Ontario. And when we visited in Australia, I found that it's quite a controversial topic there also. And because of the implications on the atonement. Now, I think in New England and probably in the Mid-Atlantic states, uh, people don't, uh, I, I don't remember people arguing minutiae over and over again, like sometimes happens in here in the Midwest. And it may be partly because of the ecclesias here come out of the Berean tradition. And uh, so much more argumentative than, um, than I'm used to in the New York area or probably that you're used to in New England. So I, I thought I'd take a look at this and see what has our community thought about this? I mean, this is this is a topic where if you ask an, an average Christian, they're going to say, well, they believe in the devil, a supernatural devil. So it's obvious the devil took him and uh, attempted him with all these things. Um, so first, I think before you ever start a study in anything, uh, it, it's kind of ingrained in me. I, I don't like to study things that are not important. So the first thing that came to my mind when I started hearing about this controversy and why uh, people in the Ecclesia asked me to do something about this because there's obviously there's some dissension even in our Ecclesia how to teach this. Um, I decided I better find out why it's important. Well, this topic comes out, uh, out of my experience and our Ecclesia's experience in teaching the gospel. It is definitely difficult to explain to someone who believes in the devil. And we have found here that convincing people there's no devil is actually a lot harder than convincing them there's no trinity uh, for the obvious reason that the trinity is never mentioned in the new testament <laughs> and the devil is mentioned over and over again and so is satan so the argument that we might use that um, the trinity is a made-up word is not something that we can get away with when it comes to talking about the devil um as Christadelphian's dissertation was internal uh, in the imagination of Lord Jesus Christ, uh, some people find that very hard to believe because they think that Jesus could never have ever even thought an idea that was contrary to his Father's will. Uh, or if, if it's external, uh, or even an angel or something like that, th then you have to explain why was something more specific not mentioned. Uh, we have at least a few people here in the Detroit area who believe it was Herod who went out into the desert to tempt them. Uh, I won't even, I will not touch on that during this class because I, I, I found it very hard to bite my tongue and not, you know, get, get laugh when I heard that. So how do we view this, whether it was external, something that Jesus thought up a, a lot of exactly the way we might be tempted or external uh, some way, you know, that some peer or somebody else trying to put plant an idea in our head. And I think it pays to take a look at these um, uh, three clauses in the doctrines to be rejected. That is the, what DTBR is, doctrines to be rejected, which is part of our statement of faith. Okay, I, I think people don't always realize the statement of faith includes the doctrines to be rejected and includes the commandments of Christ. Okay, uh, just a brief note here. There's a very good description 
of the eternal argument in uh, Ron Abel's book, Restless Scriptures, on pages 173 and 174. And he comes out very strongly in favor of internal. Uh, oddly enough, some of the ecclesias right near the, where late, uh, the late brother Ron lived uh, are, are rejecting that these days. So what's the picture? Here are these three doctrines. Uh, we reject the doctrine that the Son of God was co-eternal with the Father. So if you believe Jesus was co-eternal with the Father, then you really have an impossible time to, to even consider that this could have been in the mind of Christ that he thought of. But we reject that doctrine. Number two, we reject the doctrine that Christ was born with a free life. Now, I don't know about you, but when, when you're explaining the doctrine to be rejected to someone who's coming in through Bible seminars, this is one of these 19th century expressions that often uh, gives uh, trouble. Uh, by free life, though, in the 19th century, the brethren meant that he, uh, he could not commit sin, even though he had sin nature, that he could physically not commit sin. So if you believe that that, that that somehow Jesus then is no longer suffering as we are. He's not tempted at all points like we are, yet without his sin, as the writer of Hebrew tells us. Okay. And finally, um, uh, we reject the doctrine that he was immaculate. Uh, that means that that doctrine says that Jesus had a free will, but he couldn't use it. <laughs> Now, we know that Jesus had, it, it, you know, sometimes I find it kind of silly when I, we argue with some people about these ideas, but we know Jesus had a free will and he had different thoughts, so he would not have been in the garden of Gethsemane, promised, say, and praying that God said, like thy will be done, not my own. So he obviously had within his thinking a desire to do something else. And boy, that's as human as can be, because I don't know anybody is dying to die. Okay. So these are the three doctrines that get kind of get messed up if you um, accept that Jesus cannot possibly have an internal idea about sin. All right, so Jesus gets baptized. We'll go quickly over the slide um, at, uh, in the southern part of the Jordan Valley. And he, as soon as he does that, he heads off uh, in, in, in similar nature to Moses. Uh, where Moses spent 40 days and 40 nights on the mount. And the area there, is, and we've been through this some many years back, um, and we went through part of this in Jordan just a few weeks back. It's not desert quite like the Sahara. It's barren, mountainous, rocky area. And there's actually a monastery called the Monastery of the Temptation, which is located on the cliffs overlooking the ancient ruins of Jericho. And it's supposedly where Jesus uh, cloistered himself for those 40 days and 40 nights to shelter himself from the heat of the sun and the cold of the night. Uh, whether whether there, I, I, there, I have not been able to find any other proof other than uh, this monastery, which was built I feel, roughly about uh, a thousand years ago, so some of these some of these um, uh, are myths, and sometimes maybe there was information available then that we no longer have. But nevertheless, it is a very good barren place, and uh, the issue then becomes what actually happened. So now is where I could use some help reading, so I could save my uh, voice a little bit. Uh, somebody would read Matthew four uh, one through eleven, but just read. Uh, this these two verses because they're the critical verses. All right, I'll read it for you. Matthew right, 4. You. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Okay, so he took that straight out of Deuteronomy uh, verse, chapter 8, verse 3. 
And so he drives off the devil by quoting scripture. Yeah, so let's pay attention to that as we go along. And then uh, go on, please. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. And on their hands, they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. Okay, so if this is literal, we got to imagine that the devil had the power to take Jesus and transport him to the, t the roof, the top roof of the temple uh, in Jerusalem. Okay, let's continue this. What does he do to that challenge? Jesus said to him again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. So again, the devil is chided by words from Scripture. Okay, let's go continue. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to them, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Okay, now try to imagine this. I, I Personally, I don't know any such mountain that can show you the, all the kingdoms of the world. And so right there, we started to get a clue that this is metaphorical. And it's a picture image of temptation. It's not literal. And what does Jesus do again? Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Okay, so the devil is chased off by Bible scriptures. That in itself sort of is something to keep in mind and keep, keep our picture. And then the devil left him. Behold, angels came and were ministering to him. All right, so first, uh, it's easy. The easy thing to do is to dismiss the idea that there's a supernatural devil. It's, uh, Christadelphians obviously don't have a problem with this. And my first approach has always been, you know, can you really picture some supernatural devil being driven off by three or four verses from Scripture? And when I presented that sometimes to um, Bible seminar people, they, they, they really think about that. Yeah, that doesn't make a lot of sense uh, that the devil would be driven off by reciting a few Bible verses. And there's other, other things here that underlie this is the devil does not rule over the kingdoms of men. God does. So th that quote itself, uh, if it's a literal quote, is not the absolute picture that the scriptures give us of where the power really lies. And um, so these two verses are really critical in uh, showing the reality that there's no supernatural devil. Uh, can I get a, a Daniel 4.17 reader and a Hebrews 2.14 reader? Or readers or reader? All right, I'll read them for you, John. <clears throat> sure, thank you, Jim. Uh, Daniel 4.17. This matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdoms of men and giveth to whomsoever he will and setteth up over it the basest of men. Okay, you don't have to read the blue part. I think everybody can read that. It's, it's quite obvious that the Bible doesn't this doesn't say that the devil rules. And can we get 214? Sure. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part, taking, took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. Thank you, Jim. So again, there is if there ever was a devil, he's destroyed. He's gone. Christ destroyed him on the cross. So I, I, I think when we got to that point, I've never had any problem with people who are on the seminar people. Uh, a bigger problem comes actually among Christadelphians. And uh, the reason I'm doing this class is because, I, to me, I didn't think this was any problem at all. And as soon as it was raised by some people, and they started talking to other people, and I talk, the more I talked, the more I said, oh, my gosh, this, what I've always thought was simple turned out not to be so simple. So the temptation in the wilderness is repeated in Luke. 
Uh, it is not mentioned in the Gospel of John at all. And in Mark, it's only briefly mentioned. And in, in Mark, maybe most many people think Mark may be the most uh, correct gospel, that it was uh, uh, written at the dictation of uh, Peter. And if that is if that um, tradition is correct, um, Mark doesn't even mention him going out of the wilderness at all. It just says he spent 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness. And, and so there's no mention of him going anywhere. So that's that that is pretty um, that's pretty conclusive. If, uh, if anyone would know what happened to Jesus in the wilderness, it would have been Peter. Okay. Um, a couple of things and criticisms of the whole forty days and forty nights has come out from people like Richard Dawkins and uh, Hitchens, and uh, you know the, what I call the new atheists. Uh, they say this whole thing is myth and legend. It's nonsense. There's no way Moses or Jesus could have survived 40 days and 40 nights uh, fasting. Well, um, it doesn't really say how we fasted. And um, one should be very careful in the, these detail. Um, the actual biblical account says more that he didn't eat anything. It doesn't really mention anything about... Uh, whether he had any access to, to drink. And we are told that he was immediately ministered to by angels. So I kind of discount all this, this um, uh, medical analysis of it, that no one could survive, could survive 40 days and 40 nights uh, without eating. Um, uh, but, and I think we all know that without drinking is far more serious. And it's, it is probable Jesus had access to water. Okay, but even in that case, Moses is said not to have eaten or drunk. And I think that if God wants to preserve you, and if he can make you, your body be immortal, and he wants to do something for 40 days, I, I don't think this is a big job for God. So I trust in my faith that this, this is actually what happened. And it's pretty much not the point. The point is, Jesus was emulating Moses to show he was the prophet that Moses predicted would come after him. And in order to do that, when Moses went up the mount to give the Lord Jesus before he could give the new covenant, had to similarly dedicate himself totally to destroying the flesh. So I'm just going to run through this part fairly quickly because I, I don't I don't know if you've ever heard about this. Um, there's been a few cases where people uh, have survived uh, quite long times without food or water. Um, but the record is supposedly by this poor guy, Andreas, and I am not even going to, I'm not even going to pretend to pronounce his last name. Okay. If there's somebody here who's good at Polish, uh, that's fine. I, I had right a way. I spent about 20 years uh, collaborating with a, Polish woman scientist, and her name was Rek, R-E-K. And she used to kid me that the only reason I worked with her is I, she had the only Polish name that I could pronounce. <laughs> but, and that may be true. But anyway, this guy, Andreas, he uh, was in an auto accident, and apparently they picked him up, made a mistake, put him down and in prison and forgot about him. This was in, in Austria. And uh, when they found him uh, some 21 days later, somebody went and had a look, um, and he had, I guess he, he lost 53 pounds. Now, that, now, being sick on the ship, I lost 15 pounds. I am perhaps the only person in history who was on a cruise and actually lost weight. Um, I think I may have mentioned that Dave, I was talking to Dave Jennings before we left. I was out in L.A. and we had dinner with him, and he said he gained six pounds in seven days, and he predicted on 97 days I would come back 50 pounds heavier. So, of course, guess who's the first person I called when I came back? <laughs> so anyway, um, that's nowhere near 40 days and 40 nights. Um, if you're interested in this, and anybody, by the way, anybody wants copies of this, let me know. I'll be more than glad to send you all these, all these pictures. This is not copyrighted, not, nothing. If you want the notes and you want to use it, feel free to feel free to use them. 
Okay, so here's the kind of picture you get in ordinary Christian parlance. And the picture is quite, and I got this because talking to a Christian minister uh, of possible visions. And he didn't say he believed in these. He just said, he, he said, these are possible visions of how Christians can visualize the temptation. And when I asked him, is, it, is this something you believe in or not? He said, he repeated, this is possible ways that Christians can visualize the temptation. So I took it. I didn't didn't want to press the point. I, I got as much information as I needed. One is that Jesus was in one place all the time in the wilderness, exactly the way it is in the Gospel of Mark. And he saw all these visions presented to him by the devil. That's one possible vision. The other is that the devil, and I don't know why, the that's a really, really nasty looking devil, actually transported him to all these places. And then finally, and one that I find, I have found the fair number of Christadelphians believing, is that someone went out into the desert and presented all these ideas to Jesus and planted these ideas in his head. And this is a picture of painting that takes place actually in the cave that is where the um, that monastery of the temptation is built. Okay, so uh, I can dismiss the first two. This one, and I tell you, a fair number of Christadelphians believe this, have believed it, as we'll see in a few minutes. Uh, this one is not so clear to dismiss. Okay, so... So let's take a look at the historic perspective on this. So the earliest I could find of someone writing about the temptation of the wilderness is uh, uh, good old Robert Roberts. Uh, what, a, what an author he was. He did so much, so much material. It's just, so what, what is the historic perspective? I mean, the first thing I've been able to find was um, Robert Roberts, 1868. And he says here, his temptation in the wilderness exhibits the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life having existed in him, as in any other man, in the panorama of the world's glory, which from long fasting he had naturally dreamed and seen as a vision of abundance is seen by a hungry man's eye. In what sense would that fleshly glory have been to temptation had he not possessed the fleshly insects to desire it, the will to possess it, yes, and the power to command it. The devil that tempted Jesus was his flesh, the impure flesh, the flesh he inherited of Adam's sin nature. So clearly, that was him in 1868. Okay, let's take a look 18 years, um, I'm sorry, eight years later, 1876. Uh, Brother Andrew says, in the Christadelphian magazine, I would be absurd to speak of anyone being tempted by actual transgression, especially Christ who did no sin. Therefore, the devil here, whether an individual or the impulses of sinful nature, which Jesus in common with the rest of the work was tempted, was clearly not transgression, which conclusion is sufficient for the purpose of the present argument. So he expands on what Robert said. And now, 1886, this is beautiful. After his baptism, Jesus was impelled by the spirit in neighboring wilderness, the purpose that he might be tempted of the devil. Paul says he was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. His temptation in the wilderness must therefore come into the category of our experiences. Hmm. No man is tempted in this way. Oh, I'm saying uh, this at once excludes the popular idea that there was a supernatural personal devil that tempted Jesus. No man is ever tempted in this way, but always by the incitements of the flesh, either operating spontaneously within or presented to us in an objective manner by the suggestions of a person external to ourselves. The whole narrative of the temptation shows. It was a temptation of the latter sort, a temptation brought to bear by an external tempter, a person, not the popular devil. So this is a total contradiction of what he wrote in 1868. 
And, and believe me, when I run into Christadelphians who've been arguing about this, uh, they will, if you're on one side, you'll argue 1868. If you're on the other side, you'll argue 1886, and you'll say that, he, and here's the argument, Brother Roberts, in his more mature understanding, <laughs> realized that it had to be external. Okay. And then C.C. Walker in 1904, the, the editor who succeeded uh, Roberts in 1898, he said, after baptism came the temptation in the wilderness. There is no doubt certain difficulties in the understanding of it, but these we can afford to hold in abeyance. It is a great mistake to become lost in controversy over them to the obscuring lessons the record is intended to convey to us. The main points are clear as the sun. The Lord Jesus was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin, and he overcame through the word. And so Roberts, Roberts had changed his opinion. And what Walker was trying to do, because this whole argument on the atonement was brewing then, and unfortunately it's still brewing today, and this whole issue of internal and external is one of the flashpoints. Now, just uh, for the sake of argument here, internal, either, external, doesn't matter. That's how you can sum up those four paragraphs. So let's take a look at what we do. I always find it really hard to convince Christadelphians that something they believe with passion, no matter how small the point is, that, that it doesn't matter. And we are really, really good at arguing about minutia sometimes, and the argument turns out to be far worse than anything we could possibly have believed. Now, I won't point to any specifics, but I'm sure you all have known examples in your own head. Okay. Uh, the argument continued through the 20s with the 1920s uh, actions of the Berean split. And I, I don't think um, there's anything here that, that uh, many of you don't know. Uh, I'll just read after he quotes from Hebrews. He says, being hungered after 40 days fasting, naturally flesh and blood nature would be for food. He's in a desert place where food is not available. What more natural propensities to suggest using the power so recently given? A coming as it was from the voice of heaven announcing him as God's beloved son. A well-known brother recently clad, it is better not to understand quite who the outside tempter was. For outside, he must have been. Now, that's about the strongest statement. And by the way, there's a lot more going through the magazine. I spent about a dozen days looking through this stuff. I'm only quoting the ones that I thought were right on point. But there's a lot more pro and con that has happened over the years. Uh, Sully, um, who uh, wrote the famous book on Ezekiel's temple, uh, again, um, he goes back to Walker's argument, whether there was a personal agent or not, uh, and I call that the either argument. And then as late as 1965, in the 1960s, about the time that, um, you know, pretty close to the times when probably uh, uh, I had, you know, I must just, yeah, I think I just graduated with my PhD that year, and I remember reading this at the time. Uh, there was a letter to the editor who disputed um, an earlier argument in the magazine that year, which claimed the temptation was internal. And so he goes on to say, uh, he's, this brother, W.G. Holton, he cited Elpis Israel, where John Thomas said the adversary went forth from the presence of the Lord, came to Jesus, and then assured, assumed the character of an angel of light to him. And he goes on to quote also Christendom Astray and Nazareth Revisited, all very classic standard Christadelphian works. And um, he quotes all the ones uh, that are in favor, but he ignored all the other ones uh, which not are in favor. Uh, this, this, um, <laughs> this is the kind of stuff that if you did this as a scientist, you would be drummed out of your profession. Uh, Brother Mitchell, uh, uh, just a little bit later, um, goes back to the either-or argument. He was a master of internal 
conflicts of life, perhaps it can be best illustrated by reference to the temptation in the wilderness, whether the temptation came from within or without is immaterial. So uh, I, I want to tell them, um, you got you have a lot of really good speakers in your ecclesia, and they speak at a lot of other places. Um, I'm, I'm also, this is kind of a warning. I never, ever talk about the atonement, no matter how much an ecclesia asks me to talk about it, because I'm sure uh, uh, to get into this argument of how temptation actually comes about. Um, my favorite one, and actually I think one of the that's most the, the, that is put in the most intelligent way, and that may be just because I always thought of Brother Alfred Norris as kind of one of my heroes. Um, he said in about a decade after Brother Mitchell, he said, to this view external, there remains only that some have regarded as a fatal objection, that if Jesus could conceive such thoughts, since they were the thoughts of sin, this would make him a sinner in mind, if not in deed. But to this it must be answered that if Jesus could not have conceived such thoughts, then he could not have endured temptation either. For the external tempter to make suggestions which make no appeal to one's mind brings no temptation at all. And if Jesus' mind had been able to ponder the temptations and reject them, then it could have been done so in the absence of any outside tempter at all. This really follows from what we've already concluded about human nature and involves no offense whatsoever against the integrity of Jesus Christ. I think that's pretty beautiful. And uh, and um, I think that I especially like what he's saying, that even if it was external, he had to perceive what temptation was in order to reject it. Okay, so again, we end up uh, with the e internal, either internal or external, either or internal. Uh, now, I think you already know my choice is pretty much, I need to say, I agree with Brother Alfred Norris. I think it's just beautifully put. And it's certainly something that I hope you know, if, if you want some of these slides, you can remember the references uh, that you that you don't forget it. Okay, so here's some con some conclusions. Uh, let's deal with the skeptics first. The scriptures state that Moses spent forty days and nights without bread or water. There is no equivocation. Obviously, Moses survived, and did so did Jesus. How was this possible? I I'm not sure we should worry about it. Because this scripture answers, Luke 18, 27. But he said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. So if we're going to question surviving a mere 40 days and 40 nights without food or water and say that's impossible, then, then we reject the resurrection. You know what I mean? Yeah. That, that our decayed dust bodies can be re resurrected. I personally believe that there's no problem with that. I mean, whatever is written in the book of life, whether it's our DNA code or uh, or our various uh, sayings through our lives or whatever, God can do it. And he proved it by the miraculous powers that he focused through his son. Okay, so not, was it external? Well, <clears throat> you can make an argument that the scriptures show external evidence for sin. Because obviously Eve had no Eve had no possible conception whatsoever of sin. And so in, in that first instance, an external tempter was absolutely essential because Eve had no prior experience of anything. And that was not the case with Jesus. And uh, was it internal? The problem with this describes to Jesus' internal rebellious thoughts against God. And many find that difficult to accept. Well, what we're finding from what we read in scriptures is he had planted in his mind every answer to those internal thoughts. And I think one of the great lessons of the temptation in the wilderness is that if the word of God is implanted in our own minds to that depth, 
that when some temptation is visualized before us, whether internal or external, we need to be able to draw out those verses, those lessons that God has taught us to fight off that so it does not become actionable in sin. And I think uh, one of the greatest things that, we, that Christadelphians have, if, if we live by it and do it, is the daily readings. Because I, I know myself, I've been probably doing them now. I'm 84. I think I started when I was a teenager. Um, it's really helped me at times to remember something that I needed to remember to push off something that I should not have been doing. I, I wish I could say it was always 100% successful. That's, that, that simply would not be true. But there is a num enough times that I needed that that memory, that that verse, that thing that said, Dear John, please remember this verse and don't do it. Finally, uh, since we've been debating this for over 100 years, as we have with a few other difficult issues, it is, in my humble opinion, accepting e ether is not such a bad idea if you can get the people on both sides to realize that they don't have to shoot each other to grant the idea that maybe the other fellow has a point of view that needs to be considered. And my own personal problem with either is the external is that one has to visualize or perceive why did the scriptures not say something about where that internal, external, I'm sorry, external temptation came from. Um, in the absence of evidence, it is very difficult to prove a crime. <laughs> and, and that's just good jurisprudence. But the most important lesson we learn from the temptation in the wilderness is it teaches us how to overcome temptation. That's more important than arguing internal or external. If the word of God is engraved on our heart and personal mind, we can draw on it to kill temptation and prevent us from leading us into sin. Now, I, I, I'm sure that you will share with me this. I'm easily tempted internally or externally because that's the way we're built. And I think, I think you find later Jesus is tempted externally by Peter. And he has to say to Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. So Jesus was faced with external temptations, which are very clearly spelled out in Scripture. 